maybe so you know around a centimeter. Yeah, and then there's definitely more than this. So there's probably maybe this diameter when they were planted. Yeah. yeah. So um, I mean, it's, it's being caliper growth, and so um, but it was, they, were, they were this tall and probably about as big as my thumb. No, we actually, so these are just three leftover rows, and so what we did is we alternated um, on half the row because the riser, there's a riser one third and two thirds in, so we're only on about half the field. And so we had the riser as the dividing point, and so we had it, you know, rice bran, no rice bran, rice bran type thing alternating. And earlier in the year it's really obvious, but um, I do believe this is rice bran up to the riser and then it's a control. But part of the thing that we do find with some research that you, when you do on trees in their first leaf, um, so their first year, that trees that don't have a lot of treatments will often catch up. And so that still is something that's beneficial for growers to know, especially when it comes to something like fertilizer. Um, but yeah, we're finding in general that the trees that started out really poorly in the beginning of the year are catching up, probably as the roots are expanding. Um, so, yeah. A few questions regarding of the shaping of the tree. Mm -hmm. uh, so, why this is it the uh, angle size? Why it needs to be like this? So, it is, we don't have to worry about wind here that much. Um, farther west you do and farther north you do, but if there was, the, in general, the prevailing wind does mm -hmm. tend to come from here. And so um, I think this is just how the grower decided to stake it, because I do often see growers do the stake straight up. And people are actually starting to adopt the trellis system out here yeah. too. Um, it's not very common, but um, the trellis system, you're loosely attaching the trees to a wire. And they move the around, yeah, with the wind and they build up tallow for better. Um, I think... Uh, does, do it, does it get damaged because it moves and wire? It can. I mean, you have... Um, the trees are wrapped, so to protect them from herbicides. And so they're also like, you don't have the wire right up against the tree, you have it a couple inches out. And the, the um, what you use to attach it to the wire is used for grapes, and so it um, it doesn't damage it too much if the, the bark rubs against it. Um, so something, I guess a common theme in our tree crop production here is that there were a lot of things that growers and researchers started doing when we started growing nut crops on a wide scale that were based off of tr uh, fruit production. So very heavy pruning, very heavy shaping of the trees, um, you know, a lot of constant pruning over time, and with more and more we're finding out that a lot of these processes aren't necessary. So now in California we have a what we call, it's not completely no prune, but we have a no prune philosophy, where you might do some scaffold selection early on. You want to pull out dead branches and branches that are hanging down in the row um, so that if they're going to impede tractor movement through, but any pruning hasn't been shown to improve growth. It's at best the same as no pruning and you're saving money on labor. So we're kind of starting to find the same thing um, with staking the tree. Um, I came from a landscape horticulture background, uh, specifically with urban trees. It's well known there that the tighter you stake the tree, the less caliper growth. I think here growers like to stake the trees because it is insurance in case you have a strong windstorm blow through. But in certain areas, you just don't need to stake them really tightly and the trees grow better to give them a little room to move around. So in pistachios, we had been looking at you stake the tree right up next to the stake and now we're starting to look at research where you, you know, let the tree grow a little bit further away from the stake and move around a little bit and, you know, everything's okay. <laughs> yeah. And wind is blowing in this way, yeah. prevailing? Yeah, it would or be this coming, way. No, yeah. prevalent from this way. Okay. But um, we're far enough away from 
the coast that we just don't get a lot of wind out here in general. We mostly get them with storms, and then it's whatever direction the wind. The storm is coming from, which is usually the coast. Um, I'm, um, I'm asking this question on their behalf. Uh -huh. We were having a discussion about their solutions and what problems they have. And one of their bigger problems is the wind, high winds. Uh, something like 50s mm -hmm. that we just had, you know, once in 100 years yeah. uh, this year. Uh, they, they are common there. Yeah. Okay. So how would you how would you train a tree like to try to uh, get the scaffold strong early on? What would be your I mean just just a, that is not my a, area of expertise, but I would well, say we have this kind of this situation. It yeah. Goes down after a strong winds because it's something like this and they you can grow it like this. So a lot of growers will tie up oh, trees. Yeah. Yeah. So they will take. Um, rope and tie it around the circumference of the tree and as it continues to grow they'll continue to add up to three ropes <coughs> that's expensive but it's three very ropes, yes. yeah three ropes a couple feet apart um it's a lot of growers do it here because they push trees when they're really young to try to get them as big as possible um if you don't grow them as fast you may be able to get away with it but if you're in a high wind area that could help the number one thing that we had here that enabled growers to grow almonds and other true crops in really high wind areas is the rootstock. And that is Crimps 86. It's the Crimps, yes? Yeah. It's better, yeah? For Anchorage. None of, no one grows Crimps down here because it doesn't do well in the light soils. So we, this is a, a sandy loam here. Mm -hmm. Sandy loams are very common in the south and the east side of the valley. Yeah. But up there it's clay soils and they're really high wind areas. So Crimps is known for really good anchorage. And that's what really allowed a lot of growers to expand into high wind areas. Before that, they kept trees short. And still, sometimes they had really bad winds come through and they lost a lot of trees. But in general, it's the rootstock crimps 86 that really enabled growers to expand into high wind areas. But crimps does have a problem where it's susceptible to root knot nematode we're finding. And so you have to keep that in mind too. You know, it's not just, you have to take the entire site into account. Okay. Um, so here we have issues with ring nematode that leads to um, bacterial canker and bacterial blast. Um, I see it a lot. We just had a lot this winter because we had a cool wet winter. My first year on the job in 2017 was another really wet cold winter and I saw a lot of young orchards that were blasted with um, uh, bacterial canker and that's because they picked rootstock that's not coated with soil. So everyone wants to grow on Hansen 536 because it's a hybrid. It has really good growth, you know, it's a high, we call a high horsepower rootstock, but, you know, they put it in a site where there's a ton of ring, of ring nematodes and Hansen's about the worst thing you can put in, so, um, there are training things that you can do, but in general, before we had crimps, they kept the tree short, um, and there are other things like putting scaffolds in a certain direction that I'm not, um, I'm not so great on because we don't deal with that out here, so. Yeah, if you can, our almond production manual will go over, you know, okay. tree placement and where to put the scaffolds and the beyond the tree. So if you're using trees, if you're using trees, using trees, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you guys have any other questions about growing almonds in California or this site in particular? Not so much if you very detailed thing. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so